Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in interesting times. COVID-19 has amplified the tensions between the US and China, which are both important to Southeast Asia. The region will be at the center of the intensifying US-China rivalry for a long time, specifically in the domains of South China Sea, trade and technology. Trade and technology have become instruments of sharp power instead of enablers of cooperation. President Trump's America First and President Xi Jinping's Made in China 2025 are two competing visions of techno-nationalism. The US's aggressive technological and economic policies against what are regarded as China's unfair policies and China's responses to US's punitive actions will have impact on Southeast Asia. Besides the knock-on effects, it is possible that US may focus some policies on Southeast Asian countries if, bins, if businesses and technology suppliers are relocating to the region more than reshoring to the US. The geostrategic proximity and size of China's economy means that Southeast Asian countries need to maintain relations with China while balancing its influence. Governments, industries and businesses in Southeast Asia need to examine their exposure and vulnerabilities to this great power rivalry. They should also examine how exposed they are to the risks. If they are trading partners, their other trading partners are also affected by this rivalry. At the recent United Nations General Assembly, the UN General Secretary, Secretary General warned that this rivalry could split the globe. What are the possible impact on supply chains, flow of capital, talent and innovation? Are there national security risks if more Chinese technology companies shift to Southeast Asia, complementing the digital Silk Road, and the US reacts to this? National security is also the absence of threats to acquired values, but what if different states and societies believe in different values? US State Secretary Mike Pompeo has warned that Chinese technology could enable authoritarianism at the expense of freedom and democracy. But President Xi Jinping has said that technology helps China to promote the building of a community with a shared future for humanity. So today, we have three expert speakers to help us unpack some of these issues. The first speaker is Ms. Farlina Syed. She is an analyst in the Foreign Policy and Security Studies Program of the Institute of Strategic and International Studies, Malaysia. She has published on technological rivalry international politics and cybersecurity. The second speaker is Jikon Lai. He is an assistant professor in the International Political Economy Program at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University. His research interests lie at the intersection of international and comparative political economies and international relations. Our third speaker is Alex Capri. He is research fellow at the Heinrich Foundation and visiting senior fellow in the business school at the Na National University of Singapore. He has written extensively on techno-nationalism, such as Techno-Nationalism and Diplomacy, which was released recently on the 2nd of October. Without further ado, I now invite our first speaker, uh, Ms. Falina, to the virtual stage. Falina, please. Okay, greetings everyone. Thank you, Faisal, for the floor. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I wish to convey my gratitude to RSIS for giving me this opportunity to share and most importantly, learn from a panel most knowledgeable and experienced in this topic. I understand this will be the last panel for the Singapore International Cyber Week, and this is actually a topic most interesting um, to discuss in our time. Um, my role in this panel is perhaps to widen the discourse a little with how techno-nationalism can be perceived in referring to developing nations. Uh, in no way would it assume, uh, technically, in, in referring to, so thus, I actually have this title, Making the Technological Leap, Techno-Nationalism and Developing Nations, because we actually do have to understand that there would actually be differences in the way uh, developing nations would view some of the issues that's actually happening at the international stage. Uh, but in referring to developing nations, no way would it assume homogeneity of technological development or security considerations for the in Southeast Asia. Uh, I believe 
So the first part I'm actually planning to tackle uh, on the definition of techno-nationalism. And here I would actually refer to perhaps some of Mr. Capri's own writing uh, when it comes to techno-nationalism, which actually links uh, tech innovation to economic prosperity, social stability, and national security. Uh, with such definition, it is usually about technology and its dominance that nations may wish to pursue, whether it is for economy or national security purposes. The strategy the strategic nexus of developing nations, however, can differ. Uh, resource strapped with relative technological maturity, the idea of dominance is imposed on considerations of development and security, even with the implementation of the ASEAN Master Plan of Connectivity since 2011. In some larger economies, only two out of five people would actually have five, uh, 4G. Or according to research by Google and Tomase, seven metropolitan areas which house 15% of the region's population still account for more than 50% of internet economy. This means more than 90% may be connected to standard mobile data or would not be connected at all. And this will, be further, this will further compromise a promised digitalized future. The developing economies of Southeast Asia's manual considerations are, not, are no different than other nations with digital aspirations. The hunger to unite technology, industry, innovation, and economy have existed in Southeast Asia in the forms of developing knowledge-based economies. These are seen in, the late, in, in policies of late 1990s. Southeast Asia's industrial history is colored by multinationals from Japan uh, modernizing the manufacturing sector. These are inclusive of encouraging multinational companies to upgrade technological content and upgrade our labor, skill, labor skills. Thus, while the idea of foreign tech can be foreboding, the structure and history of Southeast Asian econ economies with technology can impact considerations for technology-related investments, transfers, or assistance particularly as a means of handling Southeast Asia or specifically in, in the past, or specifically Thailand, Singapore, and Malaysia's low wage, low cost growing pains. Lessons from two financial crises also added the need to build higher value manufacturing and services. Thus, while conversations of techno-nationalism can focus on dominance for developing nations, there are other factors playing in the strategic nexus. In weighing against concerns of security and partnerships that would deliver the value in R&D and technology, these are some indicators uh, that could add to the perception of techno-nationalism. While we might actually be familiar with more, uh, with more traditional ideas when it comes to dominance, if you're actually talking about um, perhaps how uh, technology is actually used and technological de in, uh, dependence is that can actually be exploited for you to be beholden to another nation. However, in some, uh, in, some developing nations, the transfer of technology actually becomes a pathway for it to actually develop. And this is actually what was seen in the past. One is uh, thus in this, in this table, there I have just actually collected a few uh, other factors that can actually add to a common typical analysis of what makes a country techno-nationalist based on some of the assessments that was actually given to uh, Japan in the 1980s. Among them is actually the openness of the country to actually share the R&D in tech, the emphasis on indigenous domestic supply chains, um, Perhaps on the political social would be uh, scale would be government led rhetoric on, on the necessity to actually build uh, indigenous tech. While uh, technology and defense industries, which actually indicate the rapid modernization and innovation of the defense sectors or the cultivation of dual use technology actually sharpens some of the rhetoric when it comes to national security and the development of information um, and uh, the development of information security challenges. Um, in terms of geopolitical factors, it will be something akin to building alliances to secure their own indigenous technological assets or IP. Thus, while some in while more technologically developed nations would be able to afford uh, looking at some of these nexus in thinking in a, in binary terms, if you are a developing nation, if you're actually considering uh, the security concerns, it would. Be, it would be balanced against the trade-off on being able to get some of the technologies needed for you to develop, uh, for you to actually deliver to your, to your nations, uh, to the domestic population. So, uh, but that being said, we actually do have to, uh, we have to acknowledge that 
situations in the past or the, uh, some of the developments when it came to the manufacturing in the past may actually differ from some of today's conditions. So today's conditions may create an environment that is vastly different from Southeast Asia's earlier experiences with technology, foreign direct, direct invest, investments or technology transfers. And some of these we can actually perhaps uh, see in regards to uh, the personal data for major power rivalry or uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, the mega trends on populism, populism that would pressure governments to connect the population to the internet. Uh, in the view of developing nations, power dynamics actually exist, and it exists on a technological development asymmetry. In the view of developing nations, uh, no, if we are to take Southeast Asia approaches to 5G, each nation would engage partners differently. Some would feature partnerships with European telecommunications companies or China's Huawei. These engagements range from tests in cities to use cases, lim uh, use cases that are actually related to things like virtual reality or even esports. The engagement of each country can be characterized by strategic perceptions, uh, inclusive of those related to past incidences. Um, for instance, if we were to actually look at uh, Vietnam's um, way of actually navigating the 5G or developing 5G, uh, Vietnam's, uh, Vietnam actually has Ericsson to support some of the mobile service of providers. They actually use Nokia hardware for trials. But most importantly, they actually decided to develop their own indigenous technology, um, which would actually conduct trials in Myanmar, Cambodia, and Laos. Uh, they also have a very, uh, they have a specific policy when it came to Huawei. Uh, Vietnam's experience with cybersecurity incidents, uh, such as uh, an incident with their airport uh, in the past, evaluated the need to develop indigenous capacity to maintain control of information systems. In addition, uh, strategic contestations in areas such as South China Sea has its own online and offline components, which drives the need to develop defensive cap capacities, inclusive of cyber. So Vietnam's development of indigenous 5D technology also includes building on knowledge-based capacities such as exchanges with South Korea to focus on equipment manufacturing and development of applications on the 5G platform. In uh, some of the cases, the vulnerabilities in technology or these types of uh, communication technology can be conceived through two lenses. The first is from capacity, where the inability to detect insecurities or flaws in designs could endanger end users. Uh, the second is seeing that technology itself is a neutral medium, stemming disruptive operations through multilateral engagement is a stronger argument than selective partnerships in critical technologies. However, as the developing nations improve on technology gaps and proficiency, uh, these dynamics can change. So uh, in the last slide in the deck, I have actually attempted to take a look at uh, how, how perhaps Southeast Asia would be impacted by techno-nationalism or what we would actually see in the, what we are currently seeing in a US-China rivalry in this sphere. And the reaction would be to woo the investors as these, as uh, the nations will actually seek opportunities to develop skilled and skilled labor, knowledge bases and innovation systems. The, uh, the experience with history and the understanding that the only way for you to actually address technological is asymmetry is for you to engage. You would actually require the the needs for uh, to develop to acquire the the technology or or even the knowledge on how to actually produce some of these technologies. Um, secondly, it's it would actually be an, in an almost parallel fashion would be to increase engagements to develop domestic capacity in cybersecurity, cyber investigation, law, IP, and data protection. But these would also be limited or it, would, it can actually be hindered by um, uh, methods such as uh, literacy or even exchange, uh, to increase the exchanges in, uh, in this arena so that they would actually build the domestic capacity uh, and awareness around these, some of these issues. Uh, lastly, as, uh, as Southeast Asia would actually be facing the, um, the, uh, popul the, the need to actually cater to domestic population, uh, the issue of connectivity would actually be among the first to be addressed, thus uh, in getting people online is actually a priority. So, but the trends on the horizon that would actually be necessary to be addressed would be the, the types of um, standard setting arenas that are actually quickly moving into the private sectors, which can or would not actually directly impact 
uh, industries, considering uh, if if uh, the industries are actually being relocated, then it doesn't. Um, sometimes it wouldn't wouldn't actually particularly matter on the standards that are actually being produced, but it would actually impact the type of uh, security by design that would actually be incorporated into the products that would actually have to be produced by these uh, these uh, industrial bases, regardless. Um, the second would actually be uh, to, for there to be greater cooperation in the middle and small power arenas as some of the middle and small powers in the region actually tries to find a way to navigate some of these, uh, some of these uh, issues. Um, and lastly, is actually to build more uh, capacity in cyber diplomacy so that there would actually be a gr um, greater cadre of uh, diplomats who would actually be able to address some of the issues when it comes to cyber, cyber issues or even just issues of cyber stability. Um, so these are actually some, uh, some trends uh, and also that would actually conclude the end of my presentation. Okay, um, thank you, Farlina. Uh, please unshare your screen. All right, our next speaker is Assistant Professor Jikon Lai. Jikon, please. Hi, thanks, Faisal. Um, so my, I'm sort of the odd person out on this panel. Uh, in some ways, I'm talking about neither technology nor nationalism. Uh, although the starting point of my, uh, of the content that I'll be presenting uh, is, uh, does relate to uh, the topic of this uh, panel. So what I'll be talking, uh, presenting today is a s statistical data uh, uh, that I am using to build what I call economic vulnerability and dependency uh, indices. Uh, so I'll, have to, I sh I'll give you a bit of a context of how I got here and how, it's, how it relates to, um, to um, uh, the topic of this panel. Um, so I came to this initially when the trade war between uh, the United States and China began uh, in 2008. And then as you might, some of you will recall, you know, we had you know, new, uh, numerous conversations about decoupling, uh, sep uh, separated or, uh, or separate uh, production networks and so on. And then, uh, and then obviously we had uh, from from the trade war, it sort of slowly morphed into uh, a tech war. Uh, you know, so Huawei, uh, semiconductor technologies, and and so on and so forth. Uh, and then from that, we morphed into a, a medical war or the COVID pandemic. Where and so, but you know, so but broadly, what ties all three together, you know, for me is this notion of um, the decoupling of these economic spaces. Uh, perhaps the fragmentation of production networks, and also the vulnerability of countries to um, uh, erratic or uh, random behavior by great powers. And so, that's, so that brings me to what, uh, the set of data that I'm going to be presenting. So I wanted to try and, um, so the way I wanted to try and get into this, these debates was, well, how can we assess um, the vulnerability of various economies to these sorts of behavior, right? Whether they are for nationalistic uh, motivations or whether they're just random or erratic or irrational behavior. The fact of the matter is if you trade internationally, you are effectively gonna be exposed to uh, the behavior of a trade partners for whatever reason, and therefore you're gonna be vulnerable. I chose to use the word vulnerable, although you can use dependency, you can use interdependency, but you know, so, but, the, you, I'm, but uh, this will give you a, a but the concept's more or less the same, right? So the basic approach that I've tried to try and uh, determine this, um, at least empirically and quantitatively, is as follows. So here, if we look at the reporting country, this could be country M. Country M trades with country A and country B. So this is only three countries in this world. And it does 60,000 60, units of trade with country A and 90,000 units of trade with country C, so total trade is 150. So, you know, if you do a bit of math and work out the ratios, you get that, you know, 40% of country A's uh, trade is dependent on country country uh, A and then 60% on country B. And if you sort of use this basic approach and look at the range of trade partners that a particular country do does, so in this case here, Singapore is country M, and these are all the trade partners, you work out all the ratios, you'll get a list that looks something like this. 
And if you add up all these ratios, it should add up, oh, I don't have the total there, but it, it, will, it should add up to uh, 100%. So that's the basic approach. In this particular list here, we're looking at Singapore's trade uh, with other countries on the export of goods, right, physical goods. However, as you know, a country uh, has uh, economic interactions on a number of fronts, not just in goods, mm -hmm. but it can have, uh, and goods doesn't only mean exports, it can be exports and imports, but it can also have interaction on investment fronts, uh, on services, and then on remittances, which are particularly important for uh, you know, some countries like say Philippines, Indonesia, uh, a number of South Asian economies and so on. So if you took the basic building block and you add up all these things, then you can, you know, you can build up you know, perhaps um, two different, if not more, uh, kinds of indices. One which is the one that I'll focus on in this presentation um, because of the way I'm looking at this particular um, material and I'll explain this is uh, what I'll call economic vulnerability where I will look at only export flows to the reporting country, uh, inward flows, so basically investments into the reporting country, exports of commercial services and then inward flows of remittances. Uh, of course, you can make it more complex by adding imports, both investments, inputs and outwards, and imports and exports, uh, and inward flows here. Now, um, which of these two um, columns you choose will, I think, depend on what, your, uh, what the uh, question is that motivates your analysis here. I chose to look at this because I, I thought, look, you know, if the question that we have in mind is this debate about decoupling, economic fragmentation, uh, using of economic instruments to, uh, for, to, to enforce security threats and so on and so forth, then it's kind of more likely that you know, a great power would inflict, can only inflict wound by cutting off uh, money going to your economy, right? So in a sense, taking the goods, uh, trading goods example, if China wanted to punish, you know, just for hypothetically, China wanted to punish Singapore, then the better way is to stop buying goods from Singapore rather than to stop selling goods to Singapore, right? So cutting off exports in this sense, uh, exports from China to Singapore, you know, only hurts Chinese exporters, doesn't really hurt. Uh, well, it hurts uh, Singaporean importers, but probably not as much as uh, Chinese exporters in that way. But of course, if you were in, in, in interested in both sides of the equation, then you look at this, and then this is what I would call an interdependence um, uh, variable. And you know, bear this in mind because it sort of matters uh, in the next, uh, in one of the slides of, uh, that I'll show you later. Uh, I should put a note as to the sources of this data. I use trading goods. So this comes from the IMS direction of trade statistics. Investment flows comes from uh, IMF uh, CDIS uh, uh, database, which is a relatively new database that was uh, set up in, uh, 2009. Trading commercial services comes from, um, I think, believe it was the World Bank and remittances also from the World Bank. So basically these are all official sources that have been constructed so that they can be compared across countries relatively easy, be easily because it's been standardized. Uh, but of course the usual caveats about using statistics sort of apply. Uh, they are, you know, uh, you know, th there can be issues, but this is probably the best that we'll get if you wanted to uh, look at this sort of stuff in a quantitative manner rather than just completely subjectively. So, so focusing on economic vulnerability, if we were to look at the global set of data and you look at, and so say, so we'll start the picture really big and then we'll sort of move our way down uh, into a smaller and smaller and more fine-grained view of, of what, the, what, look, what it looks like out there in the world. If you look at all the countries that do exports, for instance, where are most of these exports coming from, are uh, going to rather, so where are countries exporting to, you'd find uh, that most exports are going to the United States, right? So United States is the biggest buyer of global exports. And China, which is highlighted in red here, is ranked uh, three, seven, number seventh in the world. Now, here I am looking at the average of data from 2015 to 2017. And the reason for this is that because the trade war began in 2018, uh, that sort of clouds the, um, the, uh, what, the picture that we're looking at, right? Um, but 
even if we were to add 2018 to it, it doesn't really change the distribution of the actors too much. China goes up a little bit, but not greatly. The US is still the biggest mark, uh, uh, buyer of goods uh, or out there of, of, of the world's exports. The next question you might ask if you've not sort of seen this sort of data before is why am I using an average of a number of years rather than looking at a year in particular? And that's because I want, you know, if you took a number of years and averaged them out, it sort of um, uh, tries to, um, it deals with uh, aberrations in any one year's uh, activity, right? So we're looking, we're trying to look at something that's more stable out there. Another way, another way to look at this data, same set of data, right? Is to look at what happens over time and you see that over time, the US, at least in the last 10 years, has always been the biggest buyer of the world's exports, or, or the world's flows, rather. So here, again, I'm looking at the four flows uh, I looked at, uh, I, 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 I pointed out earlier. But even if we were to only look at uh, exports of goods, which is what most people think of when we, you know, if the average person out there in the street probably would not think about bilateral remittances, so we can remove bilateral remittances, probably won't think about FDI, we can remove that, probably won't uh, th think about trading com uh, commercial services, they will only think about exports of goods. If you only look at exports of goods, what you'd see is this. Um, let me see if I can sort this. Oh, I can't sort this on the fly. But what you would see then, you know, obviously the picture changes, China rises over time to become the second biggest uh, uh, Tag, uh, uh, destination country, but the US is still relatively bigger. Now, you, you remember in the previous picture, I talked, talked about, well, do we use just, you know, inward flows to the reporting country, or do we use flows that goes both ways, so vulnerability versus interdependence? It sort of matters because if you add in export, uh, sorry, imports of goods, so you're not only looking at exports, but also imports, then China overtakes the United States. So it, so it does matter whether you, you know, you, you look at this and it, I, so you have to take my word for it because I, you know, I don't want to sh uh, show you everything. Um, but if you, uh, it's only the, if only if you add the imports of goods, does China become the bigger uh, 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 actor out there? And, the, and this reason is sort of um, intuitively uh, makes sense because basically what this tells us is that China is the biggest source of everyone else's uh, imports of goods. And this makes sense because we all know that China has in, uh, in recent years become the manufacturing center of the world, right? So this is why. Now, whether you include it or not, again, as I said, depends on what you're really asking um, and what your question is. Uh, and I felt that in the context of this notion of decoupling or the use of economic uh, instruments as a form of a weapon, you know, China, saying I don't want to export to the world doesn't quite make sense to me, right? Um, but that said, you know, there have been instances where China has used uh, uh, export uh, controls to, um, to punish certain uh, uh, trade partners. Now, moving on to the next slide, this looks at the same set of data, but in a slightly different way. So here, these are the countries who are doing all the exporting at the bottom. How, and the question here I'm asking is how, what percentage of each country's export is going to firstly China and then secondly the United States. And you'd find that the country that most relies on China for, as its uh, destination of export is South Sudan and the number is about 98 percent and the reason is because this is largely petrol oil. And then you will see all these countries which I'll list slightly differently uh, but what you what you need to note uh, what's in, uh, interesting to notice here is that you see this gray line, uh, uh, dotted line here, that's where 10% is. You'd find that most countries don't rely very much on China, right? Again, here I'm looking at the four flows, right? So both uh, exports of goods, bilateral, uh, FDI, uh, commercial services, and uh, investment. Same question, uh, United States, biggest, uh, most dependent on the United States is Haiti. And then after that, it starts to peter off um, but you'd see that m more people kind of depend more on uh, the U.S. than they do on China because it sort of peters off much more slowly in the United States. Now, if you, just in case you're sort of interested in the makeup of this, we can look at the next uh, slide. So these are the countries and how much they depend on China. You'd find that, you know, 
you look at this, now Hong Kong, of course, makes sense to most people. The biggest sort of Western actor here is uh, Australia, um, and at 33.38 percent, and then if you so you sort of if you think about the kind of um, the, the quality of the relationship between the two countries, uh, in recent years of this sort of really makes sense, particularly since that you know uh, after U United States, Australia probably is in a, 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 in in a, a much more hot water than than other Western actors. But then if you sort of look at this and you did a count, right, this is what you'd find when you sort of look at the distribution that, again, very few countries actually rely quite heavily on China um, when you look at the range of flows. So here we're looking at exports of goods in this list. But if I were to add again uh, bilateral remittances, um, I don't think I can sort this on the fly. Ah, yes, I can. So if I were to add the other um, variables in here, oh, sorry, I can't sort this. But the, the, the picture is reasonably uh, similar. Uh, here, the same set of data looking at the United States. Now, again, looking at the same data, looking at the plots, right? Looking at, uh, again, at the moment, just the one flow, exports of goods. Uh, you again see that the clustering uh, happens at the bottom, but even if you were to add all the other flows, the clusters are also still right at the bottom. All right? So again, it goes back to show that in many ways, many countries aren't terribly exposed to either uh, of these uh, big powers. Another way to look at this global data is look at on the, uh, how they relate to each other. So here, exports of goods, dependence on China, exports of goods dependent on the United States. Here are both exports and imports of goods. Here are all the external flows, so basically what I call vulnerability, and here are all the inward flow, uh, sorry, so here are all the inward flows, what I call vulnerability, and here are all the flows, so what, you know, basically everything, so the interdependence. But what's interesting to me here is that in actual, you know, I would have thought that the dots here, basically all the reporting countries would cluster along a diagonal axes going this way. But instead what we find is this sort of L shape here. So what this says is that, you know, for, you know, these countries on the tail, they either rely more on the US and less on China or they rely more on China and less on the US. Right? So this is quite interesting, regardless of which uh, type of flow that you look at here. Then another way to look at this set of data, which are, is this way. So here, exports of goods on China, but here, it is exports on goods on China, but once you adjust it to the GDP. So remember, the data that I've been showing you tells you what percentage of a country's total exports is going to China. It doesn't tell you how much that total exports of goods going to China contributes to its GDP. Now, I account for this, how much of that is going to GDP. So what it says here is that although China, uh, South Sudan 90% of its export is going to China. That sum of export going to China only accounts for about 40% of its GDP, right? Um, so here, if we then took, I did two plot lines here. So the dotted lines show 10%. And I sort of said, just for the sake of, you know, uh, analy uh, analytical um, argument, if both variables were more than 10%, then they were really extremely exposed to, uh, China. And you'd see that really only a small handful of countries are really uh, sort of in that space. Uh, of the ASEAN, the, the green, the triangles are ASEAN economies, and of the ASEAN economies, only Singapore and Vietnam sort of falls into this space where exports of goods are concerned. If you look at all inward flows with China, then the total number of um, flows uh, of ASEAN economies increase, but Singapore drops out, right? Because then you start off look at a, a wider range of flows, so the risk is sort of spread across a larger number of baskets. The bottom does exactly the same thing for United States, uh, and then you see uh, sort of more countries um, bundled into this picture. Now, because this panel is sort of uh, focused on ASEAN, I sort of pulled out some of this information and said, look, you know, what does this look like for ASEAN as a whole? 
So this is the ASEAN economies, all these are ASEAN economies and their vulnerability to China and then their vulnerability to the United States. Now you'd see here that really again, you know, their thresholds, um, and here I'm looking at the four variables rather than just goods alone. Um, and the thresholds, you know, are again, you know, really low. This is 10% at, at the bottom here. And only really about a couple of countries, Lao here, and here, Myanmar are, you know, kind of particularly exposed to China. Uh, here, Vietnam is sort of the most exposed to the United States. Uh, Cambodia used to be very exposed, but this is sort of dropped down as it sort of spread up. It's, it's into the two baskets between China and, and the United States. So the same sort of set of data as a whole, ASEAN as a region, where are most of its goods, uh, its inflows or, uh, of its interactions going to, right? And again, it's, you know, the United States is the biggest trading, uh, biggest economic partner when you look at these inward, inward flows to ASEAN. Then comes Japan and China is sort of third in, the, in line here. Then moving on, uh, then another way to look at this set of data is to look, uh, and this is the last slide, um, what about intra-ASEAN uh, vulnerabilities? So basically here, these are the 10 ASEAN economies. How much of their, in this case, I'm looking at goods uh, value of exports are going to uh, other ASEAN 10 economies? And what's the average here? And so these are the bar charts and the average is about 25%. Uh, and to use as a benchmark, this is the European Union, the, stand, the usual benchmark, and here for them, it's about 61%. If you were to look at all the four flows, so basically the four inward flows, the, the average doesn't really change. But then, of course, the, uh, you know, how these countries are spread out look, uh, looks slightly differently depending on how much of their percentages of, uh, of uh, trade goes within the region and how much of the percentages of their flows go out, outside the region. So that's sort of all the slides I wanted to show, but I guess the big take home point for me here is that uh, in actual fact, if you only looked at the aggregate uh, figure um, and at this very aggregate level uh, of all these global economies, then you know, the exposures to either the United States or China in actual fact is really, really very low. So this debate that we've had in the last few years about vulnerability, decoupling, risk management, in many ways is being sort of quote unquote hijacked by a small number of economies uh, who are particularly exposed to either of these countries. Now, the caveat to this conclusion, however, is that of course, this is looking at the, at, at, at the uh, economic transactions as an, in a ag very aggregate manner, right? It, makes, it, it puts equal weight to all kinds of economic transactions. It doesn't make any distinction between your exports of goods or imports of goods of say medical devices versus clothes, right? So of course, for a particular country, imports of medical devices, if it's particularly exposed to China would be more important than say trade in clothing, for instance, right? Similarly, if it's trade in food, it might be more important say for an economy like, like Singapore than if it was a, uh, trade in ch uh, children's toys, for instance. Now, that, this data set doesn't tell us that. In order to tell you that, you need to drill much more in, and that's probably much more difficult to do in the aggregate level that I want to do where I was looking at all countries in the world. But if you were to take a handful of countries, then it might be more um, manageable if you were to do that. Uh, so um, I think I'll stop there, uh, and I'll well, be interested to hear your views and uh, any questions that you might have about the material that I presented. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Okay, now is, uh, we have our final speaker, uh, Mr. Alex Capri. Alex, please. Uh, Alex, I'm mute. Okay, thank you, uh, Mohammed and uh, Jikun, as well as Farlina. Thank you for that. Let me maximize my slides here. Um, so I think uh, these were these were good lead-ins. Uh, in that, I think uh, I think both both the presentations were good in in laying out some some important um, details, which I'll try to incorporate uh, in my discussion here. Um, so just very quickly. Um, so I've been really focusing most of my time on techno-nationalism uh, from a research and a writing perspective, uh, as well as a teaching perspective and an advisory perspective. So, um, you know, I'm going to try and cover 
at a high level, um, a lot of topics that are relevant to Southeast Asia uh, for businesses and also for, uh, for the other key stakeholders, including policymakers uh, and, and, and other key stakeholders such as NGOs uh, that make up these ecosystems. Um, so I, I think there, there are key elements to the landscape. Um, you can drill down and you can download and read these reports uh, on your own. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, some, some very high level ideas and then transition to, uh, to trying to apply some of these, these trends, dynamics that I'm going to talk about to Southeast Asia in, uh, in particular. And I'm going to take a look at Vietnam. I'll, we'll just do a quick snapshot of Vietnam uh, to talk about uh, some of these, how some of these things are playing out. So again, starting at a very high level, um, what is it that has changed the world so significantly when it comes to trade, when it comes to geopolitics? And this, of course, is the fundamental systemic differences that we see in the international system between the Chinese system of mercantilism um, uh, at scale versus the, 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 the traditional framework that's been in place since the Second World War, uh, since after the Second World War around open laissez-faire, fairly you know, linked to democratic uh, rule frameworks. That system is now being upended because China has become 18% you know, of global GDP um, and it's become embedded in global value chains in, in ways that um, are now um, uh, being exposed and, and, and we're dealing with these issues right now. So um, the systemic differences, economic uh, as well as political, are manifesting themselves in the trade environment in the commercial environment, and that's what I'll talk about uh, a little bit today and, and, and try to get to uh, distill that down to the, you know, what's important strategically, what's important from a risk management perspective, what are some of the scenarios that are going to evolve uh, from, from a trade and geopolitical standpoint. And to do that, I need to talk about techno-nationalism. Uh, and uh, again, um, thanks Farlina for, uh, for uh, you know, citing my definition, but it really is, uh, it really is uh, that technology is now linked to um, these key elements, right? First and foremost, uh, a, a nation's preparedness, its, its level of sophistication and innovation um, in technology is linked first and foremost to national security. Uh, and that national security is now becoming a very, very sort of um, blurry, fuzzy line when we start talking about hybrid warfare, cybersecurity, um, you know, uh, offensive actions using information and disinformation, using a platform uh, environment and so forth. So, um, you know, in my recent report on techno diplomacy, I write a lot about what's, uh, how NATO as a defense organization is being transformed uh, and to talk a lot about sort of the, the, the platform economy itself. Um, so that, and of course, economic competitiveness, um, you know, hinges on technology, industries of the future, emerging and foundational technologies. And, the, and what I really want to talk about today and why this has become such, um, such a critical issue in terms of fragmentation of value chains, in terms of strategic decoupling, that is how technology has now become tethered to, um, to ideological um, issues. Uh, so I'll get into that. I'm just gonna set my stopwatch here to make sure I don't go over. Um, so the result is we have a technology cold war, but it's more of a hybrid cold war because it's, it's, it's only focused on a certain bandwidth of trade or of commerce, right? It's not focusing on everything that, that's being traded um, you know, between China and the U.S. and around the world, it's, it's very specific strategic industries. So what this means is, um, you know, China still remains a very important market in many ways, but the question is going to be, how do companies now come up with in China for China ecosystems and in China for China value chains uh, that are sufficiently ring-fenced to uh, essentially insulate them from a lot of these other um, issues, such as export controls, 
sanctions, uh, and so on. Uh, and in that regard, it's not just in China for China, but when we talk about strategic industries, it's in India for India. It's in the EU for the EU. It's in North America for North America and so on. So that means that there will be, um, what we're really talking about is a bifurcation. Uh, we're talking about a bifurcation. So you've got China supply chain for your strategically sensitive goods, or you're simply going to have to decouple. Uh, and then you have your other supply chains. Uh, so, so we'll try and discuss that a little bit more. Um, so, uh, and this means that economies of scale are lost. You know, if we go back to the traditional, fully uh, rationalized value chains where we move operations anywhere, we unbundle our operations wherever we need to, um, um, you know, without restrictions, now we have to deal with these restrictions, which means less efficient uh, uh, value chains in many ways, redundant value chains where we, we repeat certain functions and so forth. Um, so it's a bit counterintuitive when, when you, you hear about uh, you know, technology companies like a company like Apple that you would think would be decoupling and it is, it's moving um, you know, a fifth of its iPhone production out of China at the same time, it's, it's stepping up investment in China to essentially fortify its in China for China supply chain. Uh, you see that in other industries, in the automotive industry, for example. Um, so it becomes a bit more complex. Uh, and again, we have to ring fence. We have to look as a company, we have to look at ring fencing strategic operations. A lot of what's going to drive this um, is automation. Uh, so we do have this convergence of automation and technology and IT that, that are going to facilitate um, strategic decoupling. Uh, and we see that with a number of Japanese companies, uh, you know, one company in particular, Canon, the, uh, the, the consumer electronics company, um, is reshoring a fair amount of its manufacturing out of China. And uh, those new plants are almost entirely automated. Uh, for, for cameras, for example. Um, so, so that's an interesting convergence. So I mentioned the bifurcation. The main bifurcation will occur and is occurring around so-called dual use technologies. These are commercial technologies that, that could have a commercial application. Uh, things like, you know, well, it's, a, it's if, uh, I, I think, uh, Mohammed, you mentioned the Made in China 2025 initiative. Virtually all 10 of 2025 are considered dual use technologies and essentially, you know, are licensable um, to further complicate things. China, uh, you know, the Chinese Communist Party uh, is part of this Made in China 2025 plan, um, have rolled out the civil military fusion initiative, which essentially condemns everything on the Made in China 2025 list to export controls and potential sanctions uh, from the U.S. Um, but there are other industries that, again, will bifurcate, uh, including pharmaceutical, medical, that was uh, exacerbated, you know, the, the, the issues there around hyperdependence on China, uh, you know, single point of failure in a supply chain uh, issues, those were highlighted uh, with COVID-19 and, and, of course, the medical and pharmaceutical industry and others. Um, the areas that I think uh, are are really, really noteworthy uh, are around data, where we have decoupling of data value chains, uh, and we have decoupling of internet and cloud environments, uh, and internet uh, and, and applications and uh, platforms uh, in, that, in those digital environments. And of course, we're, we're getting a foretaste of that with the TikTok issue in the United States and WeChat um, of course, with India banning, um, you know, a large number of Chinese apps, that type of thing. So that kind of techno-nationalism from a digital data standpoint, I think is going to be the most vexing. And that's going to be the most difficult to manage um, uh, going forward from a, corporate, um, from a corporate governance standpoint, which I'll talk a little bit about, and from a rules application standpoint, uh, which I'll talk about uh, as well. Um, the other uh, decoupling uh, that I think we, we're not hearing a lot of discussion about um, 
and I'll come back to this, is financial decoupling, uh, particularly around digital currencies. So as China uh, sort of ramps up its efforts to, um, to cut or to decouple or to reduce its dependence on the U.S. dollar in trade and um, leverage its own business, digital business ecosystems and get its trading partners and get um, more and more commerce to take place uh, through digital uh, and through digital payments, um, then I think we're going to see um, a significant decoupling in financial systems that a lot of people really aren't paying attention to. Uh, and I think this is a really important thing to, 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 be, not uh, to be noting. Um, I've also, again, I mean, I've, I've written extensively about all of this uh, from an innovation standpoint and from uh, what I would describe as innovation mercantilism, um, this, this, as this hybrid Cold War intensifies, I do believe we are going back in, uh, in the United States uh, and in Europe, uh, in the United States with its allies, to a kind of a new sort of moonshot uh, around technology where you have um, you know, public-private partnerships uh, involving um, you know, these, these, these historical allies with business and governments and academic and research institutions um, coming together uh, in, and, um, you know, coming together for innovation purposes and so forth. Very similar to the, the space race that we saw uh, in the previous Cold War, which was a full Cold War, uh, but was much different from the situation that we have here with China because there was very little trade or no trade at all, really, uh, going on between the Soviet Union and the United States. Um, so it was a very black and white uh, issue. But I do think that the, um, uh, when it comes to human capital, when it comes to research and development, when it comes to innovation, there is decoupling taking place there uh, as well, again, in these strategic industries. And that, I think, again, from a corporate standpoint, managing this is going to be very, very difficult. Um, so again, if it's a strategic bifurcated industry and it's going to be reshored, or at least it's going to be replicated and ring fenced, um, you know, what does that mean? Uh, I think it means, I think it means a number of things. I won't go through all these bullets, but uh, I've, I've mentioned them already, but it's going to mean a new level of, of cooperation between governments and businesses. And that's going to put businesses uh, in a very difficult position uh, going forward. It's going to put big multinational companies in a very difficult position because they're either going to be viewed increasingly as strategic assets by home governments, uh, or conversely, if they're being viewed as strategic assets that further a techno-nationalist um, uh, policy or objective, they're going to be viewed as hostile actors by, you know, opposing, by the opposing government. So typical examples would be a company, a Chinese company like Tencent, right? Uh, or even Alibaba, uh, which are involved in building the blockchain, building the cloud, building the technology that the Chinese government um, uses uh, to essentially uh, uh, pursue its, its, as I mentioned, its uh, digital currency objectives, its surveillance uh, apparatus, and so forth. Um, so, Again, um, if we look at an example of Facebook, uh, and uh, we look at both Facebook and Tencent as being caught uh, in this sort of this tug of war between markets and states, so increased state interventionism uh, and, and non-state actors, uh, you know, having to sort of negotiate and navigate through this, this landscape, uh, consider Facebook which uh, in its latest iteration of Libra, the, you know, the digital coin, which is now a, a, a fully convertible to fiat uh, a, a, you know, a, a tool, uh, which means that you know, the US dollar now uh, can be you know, ubiquitous in, in commercial, in, in digital commerce. This has sent the, the, the Chinese Communist Party into acceleration mode, trying to develop their own uh, digital currency and Tencent uh, as well as in, uh, many of the other big Chinese tech companies 
are involved in this. Um, so again, this puts these tech companies uh, in a very difficult position because they're seen as being complicit with, uh, with, with Chinese techno-nationalist policy. Uh, and of course, um, they become subject to sanctions. Um, so, so the linkages that are most important um, techno in a techno-nationalist uh, uh, perspective, uh, when it comes to that component that links uh, political values and social values directly to technology is when we talk about any kind of data privacy, anything that would presume that technology was being used to suppress uh, free expression, uh, it was being used to censor information, uh, or if technology was being used for mass surveillance or um, you know, uh, you know, mass citizen monitoring campaigns tied with the use of AI, tied to the use of um, algorithms and, and facial recognition cameras and all of these things. Um, what this means is we are absolutely going to see, um, although it's, it's a very blurry line at this point, but we're in early days now, we're absolutely going to see more decoupling um, uh, and, and the weaponization of supply chains and value chains and the use of non-tariff measures such as export controls um, in this area of what I, uh, we could call digital democracy versus techno-authoritarianism. Uh, and, and this is where I think we're really in the very early stages of, um, as I wrote in my recent report on techno-diplomacy, we're in the very early stages of uh, sort of looking at the world as it, co as it coalesces into different groups. So I think the liberal democracies, um, which if you add them up, they're about 50% of global GDP. If you, if you include India with e the EU and the United States and Japan and, and, and the others, um, those, those countries, uh, both through public-private partnerships and government-to-government -government efforts, um, are starting to coalesce around standards, technology standards uh, that address these particular issues. Of course, we've already got GDPR in the European Union um, and, and, and so on. So I think it, for Chinese companies in particular, for the big Chinese tech companies, you know, ByteDance, Huawei, Tencent, Alibaba, any of them, SenseTime, Dahua, all of them, Hikvision, um, this is an existential crisis because the, the issue, the order of the day is, and we're seeing this playing out with the TikTok um, uh, scenario in the United States, can a Chinese company compete outside of China and convince regulatory bodies and convince other governments that it is somehow absolutely divorced from the Chinese state and divorced from, uh, you know, the cybersecurity laws, the national security laws of the Chinese Communist Party. And I think at this point, that is a virtually impossible task. Uh, at this point, I, you know, I mean, I've been studying the TikTok scenario, the buyouts and the partial buyouts and the ring fencing. And at this point, that is a very difficult thing to do. So I would expect uh, significant decoupling around those, those standards uh, in the digital landscape. Uh, okay, so what are the issues? What are the issues of linkage of ideology to technology? They're human rights issues. So if you look at these, these companies and many others, uh, these are Chinese companies that have been put on the restricted entity list, uh, which essentially means that uh, you know, any, any company that uses US technology uh, is going to have to get a license to sell. And we've seen what's happened already with Huawei with um, the weaponization of uh, semiconductors by the US government and how that is essentially, I mean, that has really dealt a serious blow uh, to, 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 to Huawei. And, and, and so as we see this type of scenario play out, that is where the strategic decoupling will take place. And that is why I said earlier, there will be supply chains exclusively for China and in China, for China, ring-fenced operations, and then there will be other bifurcated uh, supply chains. In some cases, there will be no choice but to fully decouple 
in other cases, it might be possible to, you know, transfer manufacturing, restructure supply chains, and so forth. Uh, but this is clearly the theme, uh, the corporate theme for corporate governance um, going forward. Um, okay, let's talk about um, Vietnam quickly. Um, so Vietnam, I think, is a nice uh, case in point, a, a nice study, um, because Vietnam is straddled uh, between both the West, if you will, or this digital democracy as a trading partner and as an FDI destination, and China. So as supply chains restructure and as some of them move to Vietnam, including many uh, Chinese run and Chinese owned operations, as they move to Vietnam and set up shop and begin to operate, Vietnam is a member of these very progressive free trade agreements, right? It's part of the CPTPP, which by the way, it's not possible to ponder uh, or to consider consider whether the United States will return to Trans-Pacific Partnership under a Biden administration. Uh, and if that, if that happens, those, those 20 so or odd uh, provisions that have been suspended in the, in the CPTPP around IP protection, uh, around digital trade and so forth, those could be uh, potentially reenacted. So that means that you have, this, just as an example, we could have Chinese owned companies operating in Vietnam, exporting product to Europe or the United States under these different free trade agreements under the EU uh, Vietnam FTA or the, or the CPTPP that would then have to um, meet standards around data privacy, uh, around ethics, um, you, know, in, you know, all kinds of so-called progressive, very you know, quote, Western uh, ideals that are, that are baked into these agreements. And then on top of that, it's very likely that these multilateral agreements will, have, will see additional carve outs when it comes to digital trade that will address uh, these issues around censorship and so on. So I think this is really the, this is really the issue for companies um, going forward uh, is how, from a corporate governance standpoint, do A, we have strategic bifurcation and strategic ring fencing and or reshoring, B, and again, this is hard technology, this is data, and these are platforms, uh, and then again, how, you know, how do we implement the so-called five T's, right? Truth, trust, transparency, technology, and talent to, uh, to manage these issues. Uh, so I think, I, I think, again, these really are the highlights. And again, I, I would invite you to, to you know, download the reports and, and check them out uh, for the deep dive. That should conclude mine. Let me uh, end share. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Alex. That was a very wonderful presentation.